Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Well, welcome everybody to another episode of the Examine Life with Phil here. And once again, I've got a guest with me. This time we're going to be talking about the ontological argument. And for this, I've brought on Dr. Ben Arbor, He's got a Ph.D. from the University of Bristol, and he's got two master's degrees from Southwestern Baptist University. Did I get that? Did I get that right? No, so it's Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. Theological Seminary. Pardon me. Good thing I asked you, sir. That's all right. Yeah. Okay. Now, I asked uh, Ben to come on and talk to me about the ontological argument because I saw just a couple of weeks ago that he was giving a defense of it at the Central Meeting of the American Philosophical Association, And I've been wanting to do something more in depth about the ontological argument for some time because, well, that's what I wrote my master's thesis on. I'm very interested in ontological arguments, and who better to come on and discuss that with me than somebody who is going to defend it at the Central APA. And on top of that, I've been doing this segment for people who are listening about arguments for the existence of God, and usually I can just do that in 10 or 15 minutes, but we're going to need a whole lot more than that to talk about the ontological argument. It's its own animal. It's complicated and difficult. We might wind up uh, going really deep into the philosophical weeds here, so if we do, just bear with us. We enjoy it, and if you don't understand anything that's being said, write in and ask me about it, or write in and ask uh, Ben about it. I'm sure he'll be glad to uh, engage with you as well. So, First of all, Ben, uh, thank you so much for coming on. I, I really, really do appreciate it. I've been looking forward to this since you agreed to come on. Yeah, well, I'm really, really happy to be here. This is a, a real treat for me. Um, I also am very interested in ontological arguments, so it's nice to be able to talk to somebody else about it, and maybe yeah. we can share our thoughts in a way that benefits other people. I, I will correct you when you say that uh, there's nobody better that you could have on than me, because there's plenty of people who know a lot more about <laughs> arguments than I do, okay. but I, I am appreciative of the invite and look forward to hopefully being able to share some thoughts that I've been trying to develop about why I think at least one version of the ontological argument might might be pretty useful. Okay, good deal. Well, <laughs> for people who aren't uh, familiar with you, haven't come across you before, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Just generally speaking? Sure. So um, my name is Ben Arbor. <laughs> I live in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, been married to my wife, Meg, for coming up on 15, uh, 16 years, and we've got four kids. Um, I grew up in a pretty normal household, mom and dad, who uh, recently retired. They live in Colorado now. But um became interested in kind of religious stuff pretty normally, I would think, as as most children do and start to think about things. Um, when I was in college, at, did my undergrad at Texas A&M University, mm-hmm. um, I had a pretty radical religious experience. There was a, a campus preacher who was like hellfire and brimstone type stuff. Um, that really captured my attention. And uh, I I, I won't say that I endorse all of his evangelism methods, but that seems to be what God used to really get my attention. And um, I understand myself to be someone who really actually became a Christian and I gave my life to God uh, my junior year of college at A&M. So that would have been... Uh, 2002, spring of 2002. Um, I went into the Army after graduating from college. Um, and uh, four years in the Army was three and a half too many. I <laughs> really did not enjoy the hurry up and wait culture. Um, and so when I satisfied all those responsibilities, uh, I actually went into banking. And... Um, was able to get out of banking before the collapse happened. I 
Oh, thank goodness. I wanted to go back to school. And um, after becoming a Christian, I really, really became interested in thinking very hard about um, about God. And uh, I was fortunate. I had a, a little Gideon's New Testament, uh, the, the little green one that has the entire New Testament plus the book of Psalms plus the book of Proverbs. That was it. And uh, I got into the habit of trying to read through all of that once a month. Hmm. For, for a couple of years, um, but I, I later became interested in other theological debates that I don't think can be fundamentally settled by appealing to the meaning of this Greek word or this Hebrew mm -hmm. construction of the of the Old Testament or whatever. Um, and while I was in seminary, several friends encouraged me to continue to um, pursue a more philosophical view of things. Um, my wife and I left seminary for a while, and we went on staff with a missions organization, and we moved to China. And um, while we were in China, we came to find out that several of the executive leaders of this uh, organization had come to embrace a view called open theism. Okay, yeah, we've talked about that a little bit on yeah. the podcast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the idea that God doesn't know all of the future that is eventually going to happen. Uh, there's lots of different variants of this, but um, that really is kind of the thing that set me on to deciding I really want to think through a number of theological issues, not just by reading the Bible, but also by thinking philosophically about how to interpret the Bible. Um, and as a result of that, we, we ended up moving back home, and I ended up finishing a master's degree at Southwestern. Um, I studied with a guy named Greg Welty, who had done his doctoral research with Richard Swinburne at Oxford mm. University in England. Mm -hmm. And he really helped me develop my thinking on not just issues related to open theism, but the doctrine of God in particular. Um, and that's kind of what led me to develop an interest in in the ontological argument so i oh good. very i was going to ask you where that interest came in so yeah. yeah yeah so i'm really interested in who god is that's mm -hmm. that's what motivates this arguments for the existence of god are not as interesting to me as the question of who god is okay but i do think that there are certain arguments for god's existence that kind of give us clues as to who God might be or what God might be like. And the ontological argument is one of those. And um, I, I would guess maybe for the last 10 years, I've really been trying to think hard about uh, ontological arguments, different varieties of the argument, what they establish, what they don't establish, mm -hmm. uh, reasons why they might not be good arguments, reasons why they might be good arguments. And that's kind of what led us into this discussion today. Yeah. Okay. Well, fantastic. Um, you mentioned you were in the army. I was in the army. What years were you? Uh, were you in? So let's see. I signed uh, my contract in uh, the year two thousand. So it was two thousand until two thousand and four. Oh, okay. Uh, and that was uh, interesting. I got to do some fun stuff. Spent a lot of time at Fort Hood. A little bit of mm -hmm. time in Fort Lewis, Washington. And uh, a little bit of time at um, Fort Bragg in North Carolina, and then just just a very short stint of time at Camp McCall, right right outside of uh, uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. So, okay, yeah, that I was, was in from uh, two thousand. That was about thirty pounds ago, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. yeah. I, for me, it was about 30 pounds ago as well. Um, I was in from 2000 to 2005, but I was over in Germany and spent oh. time in uh, Iraq for the last okay. year. I, actually, I was supposed to be in for four years, and it became five, and that's why I was over in Iraq for the first time. And yeah, uh, excuse me, not the first time, for that last year. Do you have a lot and of yeah, fun I'm in the sandbox? To... No, I did not have fun. <laughs> uh, when it was time to get out, I had to go see like the... Uh, National Guard and the reserve recruiter, and uh, I was kind of polite, but basically said to him, you know, I just have no interest in doing all this again. The uh, the army's kind of ruined me on it, so yeah. thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I can certainly understand, but all the same, thanks for your service. Um, 
Likewise, thanks for your service as well. Kind of a, I guess, shame we didn't run into each other 15, well, 15 18 years never, ago. I but deployed or did anything exciting like you did, so very different situation for me. See, uh, I can understand that because people will tell me like, oh, you were over in Iraq, you did all this stuff, and I'm like, well, I was a communications guy. I made phones and the internet work. I, I wasn't out kicking in doors and getting shot at. Those are the people you should be thanking, but... All the same, that's very kind of you to say. I appreciate it. So, sure thing. Okay, so uh, well, let's get back on track. We're here to talk about the ontological argument, not just swap veteran stories. I guess we could do that later sometime. Um, so, basically, uh, why don't you, uh, as briefly as you can, if if it can be done briefly, <laughs> define for people who aren't familiar with this or barely familiar with it, what are ontological arguments? Yeah. Well, the way that you framed the question, I think, is a good one. The first thing that needs to be said is that <clears throat> ontological arguments are a family of arguments. There's not just one single ontological argument. And there are very important distinctions to be made between um, Anselm's ontological argument or um, Cartesian ontological arguments mm -hmm. or um, Charles Hartshorn's ontological argument, Alvin mm -hmm. Plantinga's ontological argument, but the simplest way that I could articulate it, it would be an ontological argument is any kind of argument that seeks to establish the existence of the thing in question on the basis of the nature of the thing that is in question. So these are typically okay. thought of as a priori arguments. But as hopefully we'll get a chance to discuss later, I don't think that all ontological arguments are essentially a priori. I think that there are ways that we can incorporate a posteriori reasoning into mm -hmm. ontological arguments successfully. So, uh, but that's, that's kind of, one way that they're often described is that they're all a priori arguments. And um, what does uh, a priori and a posteriori mean for people good. who aren't familiar so, with it? So it's easier to understand the distinction between a priori and a posteriori by examining them in reverse order. Mm -hmm. A posteriori reason, posterior, uh, in this instance means after. So I examine the world, I have certain experiences, and in light of those experiences afterwards, I then use that in order to make sense out of some argument that I'm thinking of, whether it's a, an inductive argument or a deductive argument, or maybe even an abductive argument. This is all making use of evidence uh, that's generated by experiences in the world. So that'd be something like uh, arguments for God based on fine-tuning in the universe, because you need to observe that there's fine-tuning in the universe before you can make the argument. So it's a very good example. Um, maybe even certain cosmological arguments for the existence mm -hmm. of God uh, would also fall into that category. There's a lot of debate, it seems to me, as to whether the moral argument for the existence of God counts as an a oh. posteriori mm -hmm. argument or an a priori argument. And it seems like you could probably, depending on how you would want to argue, get there mm -hmm. both ways. So maybe there's yeah. two different versions of the moral argument for God's existence. But um, ontological arguments are thought traditionally to be a priori arguments, which means they, they're not derivative of any kind of experience. Instead, we're just thinking about the concepts under consideration themselves and um, the relationships that would exist between those concepts rationally considered. So I don't need to bring into these arguments a lot of reflection about the world or other experiences mm -hmm. that I've had. Now, I'm trying to develop at least a certain approach to ontological arguments that makes use of a posteriori reasoning. So... Maybe you can have a posteriori ontological arguments. Uh, maybe oh. that's something we'll have an opportunity to talk about later. But I, yeah, I'd be very interested in that. That sounds a uh, like an appealing idea to me. Now, um, I apologize that this wasn't in the notes I sent you, but it just 
just comes to me now. Are you aware of any case where people have made ontological arguments for something other than God? The only example that I have co- that comes to mind is where Descartes made one about uh, triangles, but he was doing that to try to justify his ontological argument for God. So, um, so <clears throat> Descartes a tricky, tricky guy to understand. You know, that's he's certainly the case. Yeah, <laughs> he's clear and distinct ideas but reading Descartes isn't exactly clear and distinct <laughs> very true <yeah. laughs> uh, you get three philosophers in a room and you have 12 different opinions about how to properly interpret Descartes um, there's the famous famous objection against Anselm that Guanilo gives he mm-hmm. tries to give an ontological argument for a uh, uh, greatest conceivable island right so yeah yeah the parody but it's not not clear to me that he was i mean he the whole reason that he offers that is a reductio he's he doesn't think it works um so he's not actually offering that as an ontological argument for the existence of a greatest conceivable island um but that would be another example of of what somebody could try to do with an ontological argument um, okay but no i'm i'm not aware of any others but yeah, i'm doesn't there there probably are and i'm just ignorant mm-hmm. of them but uh i'm not aware of it i'm i'm other than the descartes example i'm really not either and i've i've often kind of wondered if maybe this is a case where this really is only something you can do with regards to god no maybe it's not i just because like you're saying just because i'm not aware of it doesn't mean they aren't out there but <laughs> Yeah. Well, it, so. it, now that I'm just thinking about it a little bit more, it seems like unless you want to be a nominalist about other necessary beings like numbers, um, mm. you can probably develop ontological arguments for the existence of numbers pretty easily or anything that you think is a necessarily existent thing. Um, if you could do it for triangles, it wouldn't be hard to do it for squares and circles. and Yeah, that makes sense. And mm-hmm. drums and, yeah, so... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's uh, well. I I tend to come down against nominalism, so I'd probably be pretty sympathetic to that. So um, even though I, as I talk to other philosophers, I find I'm usually in the minority on that <laughs> viewpoint. But well, I I've embraced uh, a very comfortable position being in the minority on all number of philosophical issues. <laughs> but but I, I'll join you. I'm not a nominalist about. Oh. Absolute- objects um, i don't think abstract objects exist because i'm a, i'm an idealist <laughs> i think oh. everything that exists depends on mind so um if we defined abstract objects as things that exist independently of mind well i don't think any of that stuff exists so um and i think this yeah. is this is act i mean i'm i'm an evangelical christian but I'm one who subscribes to the Nicene Creed. And when we say that God is the creator of all things, seen and unseen, um, it seems to me that the divine mind is necessarily involved in not only creating, but sustaining everything that there is. That would seem to follow, yes. Yeah, so if everything that exists is in that sense dependent upon the divine mind, well, then it just follows that there exists exactly nothing that exists independently of any mind. And if that's just the way that we want to define abstract objects, well, then there are none. Um, and thus says the creed. So I'll, I'll stand with uh, the Cappadocians and St. Athanasius on that one. And I don't think they were ignorant of what they were talking about when they said that. But that's a discussion for another time. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, moving on, uh, since there are multiple versions of the ontological argument, like I can probably name a four, name you four or five off the top of my head, which versions do you think are the strongest or the most promising? And like from the research I did, I, I, I generally came to the conclusion that the consensus was that the modal versions that are contemporary with us, you know, they came about in the last 50 or 70 years or so, those are the strongest. And of those two... It's Planiga and Kurt Gödel's versions that are generally considered the best. Is that's what I found the consensus seemed to be. What do you agree, or what do you think? So, um, 
yes, I, I agree that modal articulations of the ontological argument are the best. Um, I, I am also sympathetic to the idea that there's not just one argument for the existence of God, but there's, to borrow from Plantinga, two dozen or so arguments mm -hmm. for the existence of God. And if there's something like a cumulative case that we can use to establish or you know argue for not just the rationality of belief in God, but maybe for God's actual existence, then I don't see why we couldn't do that with multiple different versions of the ontological argument. Um, okay, so, yeah, I and, get that. In, so I'll defend Plantinga's version. I think that's probably the, the easiest for us to talk about here. But um, Michael Almeida has recently put forward a, a different version of the ontological argument that I think is a successful modal ontological argument. Yujin Nagasawa has also um, been defending a reformulation of Anselmian theism that ends up dovetailing very nicely with numerous articulations of modal ontological arguments. So what I see Eugen doing is saying, let's let's try to figure out what the divine nature is. And then once we have that, it sure seems like there are some ontological arguments that can prove that, that mm. that being actually exists and isn't just a figment of our imagination. So, um, yeah, but I, I'm still very sympathetic to, to Anselm's argument. Now, I'm did some time. I did most of a master's degree at the University of Dallas. I didn't finish it. Mm -hmm. uh, University of Dallas is a Roman Catholic school that uh, is run by a bunch of Cistercian monks, and they're really nice people. They're they're all Thomists, or almost all of them, I should say. Um, and they really taught me a lot while I was there. But one of my professors, we spent a lot of time reading Anselm. And I think it is a mistake to understand Anselm's argument. First of all, I think there's two mm -hmm. arguments in Anselm for the ontological world. One in Prosologion chapter 3 and one another one in Prosologion chapter 15. But I don't want to bore us with the details there. But it's important that we understand what Anselm is doing. The whole thing is a prayer that he has written out for us. And, and it's meant to be contemplating the divine being while in prayer, while seeking communion with the divine being. So to try to extrapolate what Anselm is doing independently of the mode of thinking that he is trying mm -hmm. to put it forward in, I think really does violence to properly understanding what Anselm is up to. Now, I want to make a distinction between Anselmian ideas and a proper exegesis of Anselm. And here's what I mean by that. It's one thing to really seek to interpret Anselm on his own terms and ask, what is he doing? Mm -hmm. In this case, I think it's a mistake to talk about uh, Anselmian ontological arguments that are natural theology or whatever, and independent of any special revelation or communion with God or prayer. I don't think that's what Anselm's up to. But I don't think that it's silly to say he had some ideas and we can appropriate them. Um, uh, maybe one contemporary way to think about this <clears throat> would be to think about Einstein's theory of relativity. Um, there's what Einstein himself thought. Mm -hmm. and there are ways that we can say, given his ideas, how can we build on them or how can we... Mm -hmm. uh, appropriate them into quantum theory and uh, the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum theory or you know, these other mm -hmm. articulations. So um, if, if anybody wanted to do that and somebody was to come along and object and say, that's not fair, that's not what Einstein was doing, okay, fair enough. But at some point we have the conversation about what Einstein was doing and then we move on to say, how can we appropriate these ideas? In yeah, how can we take his good idea and make it better? Right. So in much the same way, we can have the conversation about what Anselm was doing. And then there's another conversation that we get to have about, well, were his ideas any good? What do we do with this stuff? Um, yeah, that that sounds to me like the distinction between 
uh, doing historical philosophy in the sense of saying, well, what did this philosopher say? What did he mean? And then doing it in the sense of, well, is it true? Is it a good idea that... Right. Yeah, yeah. And Was he so, right? Exactly. Were yeah. ideas valuable? You know, mm-hmm. uh, that those are separate questions altogether. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Okay, good deal. Um, and for people who aren't familiar with the term, what do we mean when we talk about modal ontological arguments? What, why do we call them modal versions? Okay, so um, the metaphysics of modality is tricky. Uh, <laughs> yes, that's true. <laughs> but what we're dealing with here is the nature of possibility or the nature of necessity. Um, that's the title of Al Plantinga's book, The Nature of Great Necessity. Book. Yeah. yeah, hard to read, but very um, hard to read. Yeah, but not, good book. Not an intro to philosophy text. No, but a very, very important work that developed uh, a, a lot of important ideas that were birthed out of the death of logical positivism and kind of the the development of the analytic turn that seems to have taken place at the beginning of the twentieth century and then outworkings from that. So. Um, I think the two greatest things that really happened in the 20th century for philosophy were the development of a metaphysics of modality um, and in philosophy of language, uh, obtaining a semantics that helps us to make sense out of the metaphysics of modality. (laughs) Those seem to me to be the the two most significant advances that took place in the 20th century. Modal so ontological we, arguments, yeah, they, they just kind of proceed by thinking about the nature of what is possible or what is not possible, okay? Okay. And <clears throat> that's very different than other ontological arguments. So Anselm's argument, he wants to reason by thinking about the greatest conceivable being. And insofar as Anselm is focused on what conceivability is, there's an epistemic component to everything that he's thinking about. Because we're rooting this in what is conceivable, as opposed to um, Al's argument is about the greatest possible being. Mm -hmm. Who, Who cares if we can conceive of that being or not? We're, we're in, the modal ontological argument, which we'll explain here in just a minute, is moving away from what I can think about, where the focus is on conceivability, and moving it towards what there is or what there is not, the greatest possible being, regardless of whether I can conceive of it or not. Now, having said yeah, all human that, perception is limited, so maybe there's something greater than what we can conceive of. Yeah. Right. Now... Anselm addresses this a little bit by saying that not only are you that than which none greater can be conceived, but you are greater than can be conceived. Um, This is part of the difference between his two arguments. But I don't want to get hung up on that. Um, And I also just want to mention this because there will hopefully be listeners who are aware that there is a long literature in philosophy about whether or not conceivability entails possibility some people oh yeah Mm -hmm. if i can conceive of something then that means it must be possible um and there are other people who think that's not right and i think that we can sidestep a lot of those debates um by focusing not as anselm did on the greatest conceivable being and just talk about the greatest possible being. And that's yep. that's a huge ed- step forward that it sounds really, really simple, but once you look at the underlying logic and the metaphysics, it is a tremendous development that we see in, um, in the Godelian articulation of the ontological argument and the Plantigian articulation of the ontological argument. So Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. That was the distinction I made when I was writing my thesis on this is to say, well, this is the way Anselm hit on it, but the greatest poss- saying it's God is the greatest possible being is superior to saying God is the greatest conceivable being for just these couple reasons, just and it avoids so many problems just so quickly and easily. So, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So um, I guess now might be a good time to actually try to offer 
an example of a modal ontological argument. Yeah, I was going to ask you to do that. That is a good idea. Yeah, please do. So it seems to me that modal ontological arguments, the basic structure of them goes like this. Possibly God exists. Therefore, God exists. <laughs> now, there's several yeah. steps in between the the possibility claim and the conclusion and the way that we get there it's important but that's basically what's going on and that's why i want to call ontological arguments a kind of argument that reasons from the nature of the thing under consideration from from just the nature of it to its its existence um so here we go <clears throat> premise 36 in Alvin Plantinga's book, The Nature of Necessity, is maximal greatness is possibly exemplified. Excuse me, it might even be maximal excellence is possibly exemplified. I can't remember right off the top of my head. I got the uh, copy of the book here right back here if you right, want right, me to look it up here, for you. We're going to find it. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> At least I thought I did. No, actually, the copy of my my copy of the book isn't here in the office. I have it out on display with my classic books. So, okay, well, hold tight for me. I, I'm certain that I have it. Um, That's a pretty impressive looking library you got there, by the way. I'm jealous. Well, come over. You can use it. If I lived in Texas, I probably would. <laughs> yeah, but you're going to be here in like two weeks, so we should totally That's hang out. Okay. All right. Look, yeah, I, I, I'm looking I forward to that. It. Forget about premise 36 for a minute. Let's just, we'll, we'll define our own. We'll call it premise one in our argument, okay? Okay. Right. And I just want to define it this way. Possibly God exists. That That's it. That's all I need, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, the word possibly, I want to uh, help people understand, has a very technical term in in philosophy, especially in modal metaphysics. But if you don't, like having to worry about all that here are some alternatives that you can use maybe god exists um it could be the case that god exists uh perhaps god exists those are all for the sake of our discussion logically equivalent statements okay okay, okay. But, but i'm going to stick with the word possibly because as we'll explain here in just a minute we, we need to show why that word means something important. Now, according to the modal metaphysics that was developed in the middle of the 20th century and is almost universally agreed upon by both Christians and non-Christians and theists and atheists and whatever, it makes sense to talk about possible worlds. And these are not things that we would consider like uh, parallel universes or, or, or things that sometimes get described in science fiction. That's not what a possible world is. A possible world just is a maximally consistent state of affairs. So there's a, there's a possible world in which I exist. Um, there are other possible worlds in which I do not exist. A possible world just describes any way that things could be. So and this isn't Star Trek. We can go to parallel dimensions. It's no. Hey, maybe maybe it was the case that my mom and dad didn't meet, and I was never born. That's a possible world. Um. Yes, a lot of people think that that's a possible world. I think that's a possible world, right? Um. How you understand a lot of this stuff gets really, really tricky. Okay, and. I'm just going to go into the weeds here for a second. I am somebody who thinks that you can construct a very well-developed systematic metaphysics if you have a good account of properties, a good account of the laws of nature, um, a good account of modality, and a good account of causation. If you have those four things, I think you can develop a pretty robust systematic metaphysics and a lot of things are going to fall out of what you believe about those four things that you believe about agency, things that you believe about free will, things that mm -hmm. you believe about um, time, things that you believe about any number of things are going to be um, 
ontologically downstream of what you do with those first four, okay? But modality is one of those ones that's pretty fundamental. So let's make sure we get this right. Okay. When we talk about modality, we're, we're talking about the way that things might exist. And there are three important terms. I think I alluded to this uh, earlier. Um, something can exist necessarily, which means it has to be that. Mm -hmm. Something could be impossible, in which case it cannot be that. Or something could exist contingently. If it's contingent, then that means that there are some possible worlds where it does exist, and there are other possible worlds where it does not exist. Anything that is contingent is neither necessary nor impossible. It's like in between mm -hmm. those two extremes, right? Yeah, so it would follow from that then that pretty much everything we see and observe is contingent because it exists in some possible world and it's if it exists it's clearly not impossible is that oh yeah you say so that's, that's probably that's right certainly true anything that exists mm -hmm. is most certainly not impossible if it was impossible then it wouldn't exist at all yeah but there may be certain things that we experience or that we see that um although they're actual and therefore they're certainly possible they might be necessary right well, I was thinking of like uh, books, since we're talking in each other's offices, we see each other's books, sure. like a computer or uh, by car. What would be then some examples of things that might be necessary? How about numbers? Okay. okay. Um, numbers seem to be necessary. Now, if, they're, if they exist in the world, then they're possible. But just because they're possible doesn't mean that they're contingent. There are some, some things that are possible that might be necessary and they exist not just in this world but in all worlds so you okay. would say that if something is necessary it's also possible the the oh yes that's you go together in that sense not necessarily where something is possible it is then therefore necessary but we can say if something is necessary then it definitely is possible yeah so let's slow mm -hmm. that down and say that again that's super important okay if, so if something yeah, is ahead. necessary again if something is necessary then it is possible. But just because something is possible doesn't mean that it's necessary. There are lots of things that are possible, but they are not necessary, all right? Your, your car, um, this conversation that we're having. Yeah, um, maybe one on, of us uh, on this particular show up. Yeah, sure. Um, but uh, maybe there are certain things that, are possible and they're necessary. Um, they have to be this way. Um, maybe, maybe God is one of those things. Maybe God is the kind of being that if God really is God, then God couldn't fail to exist. Uh, and there seem to be, at least in my mind, lots of good reasons to think that. Mm -hmm. um, and this is where things get really tricky. And this is why Plantinga, instead of talking about possibly God exists, he says possibly maximal greatness is exemplified or maximal excellence is possibly exemplified. I can't remember the exact wording, but what he's saying is that maybe there is a possible world where a maximally great being exists. Now, if there's any one single world where a truly maximally great being exists, then that seems to have implications, not just for that particular world, but for other particular worlds. Here's why. Which being is great? Let's just consider two possible worlds. We'll call them uh, world one and world two, right? Okay. And, and I want you to think about two different beings. One of these beings is all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-loving, but this being only exists in world one, does not exist in world two, okay? Okay. Call, the, call that being Shmod, okay? Now I want you to imagine not Shmod, but God. God, all-loving, all-powerful, uh, all-knowing. And that being exists not only in world one, 
but also in world two. Now, considering God and Shmod, which being is superior? Well, obviously, God would be because he exists not just in one possible world, but in two. Well, that seems right to me. OK, your intuitions and mine are very much alike in this regard. Now, we are defining God as a maximally great being. If God is a maximally great being, and we have just from this little thought experiment between Shmod and God realized that any being that exists not just in one world, but in more than one world, you can extrapolate that out and see that a truly maximally great being wouldn't just exist in one or two worlds, but would actually mm -hmm. exist in all worlds. Mm -hmm. You see this? Okay. Yeah. That follows. Now, if yeah, that, you would... if that's the case, just from the concept of God, if that God exists in any single world, then by definition, that God would have to exist in all possible worlds. And if God exists in all possible worlds, then God exists in this world, the one that you and I are in right now. Because this world is a possible world. Well. I sure hope it's yeah. a possible world. If it's not a possible world, then we don't exist. <laughs> and that well, raises a lot more complicated philosophical <laughs> questions than I would want to engage in tonight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah if, you'd have to go pretty far to say, I do not exist. So, and that would be a pretty obvious contradiction. That, so <laughs> That might be the opposite of the examined life. <laughs> I like that. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, see, I've uh, I've always been fascinated by this argument. That's why I wrote my thesis on it because it's just um, it's so very very different than every other argument that's been given for the existence of God. All the other ones, even if whether you like them, think they work, think they don't work, they're typically very easy to understand. Un un you can wrap your mind around what cosmological arguments with moral arguments what they're trying to do very quickly the logic is just so self-evident in those ones where in this one it's almost like part of the question is what is it even trying to do um the logic is not quite so clear and obvious it gets so much more technical and difficult so that's right. a, i like your uh I like the version of it you give i think that's uh, the basis of the most of the good ones that i've read might too so now an objection that I've heard leveled at this is that it kind of depends too much on this concept of possible worlds, and that's a concept that is problematic or only held in, like, say, analytic philosophy. What would you, how would you want to respond to that? Yeah, so I'm, I understand that objection. I'm not scared of analytic philosophy. It's kind of what I do. Um, <laughs> so... Yeah. There's one of these responses that's just kind of like, okay, well, give me an alternative. You you show me how we ought to be talking about possibility and impossibility. Construct for me a metaphysics of modality that does not result, um, depend on possible worlds, and then then we've got something worth talking about. But until then, possible worlds is just a complicated philosophical speak of of a coherent account of the way that things could be or could not be. Mm -hmm. yeah, so yeah. It, if you want to object to the jargon, fine, object to the jargon. Um, but that's that's useless to me because when I sit down and am trying to talk to my children about baseball, because it is the great American pastime, uh, <laughs> I... I expect that they are going to learn what a pitcher is, what a catcher is, what a first and second baseman is, what a third baseman at the hot corner is, uh, what a shortstop is. And same thing for football. It's not going to work to say, now the one guy in the middle who gets the ball and he throws the ball at the other guy. At some point, you have to learn what a quarterback is and what a wide receiver is and who the linebackers are on defense. Um and and this isn't just for sports. I mean, this is true for for ballet, um, mm -hmm. for anybody who wants to learn first position and second position and what a plie is or uh, whatever the case might be. We expect 
that a normal part of maturation in any skill is that you're going to adopt a vocabulary and learn how to use it properly. If people yeah. want to object to analytic philosophy because it makes use of terms that, uh, that didn't exist prior to the development of the metaphysics of modality in the 20th century, that's fine. But I would expect that those same objections are going to be leveled against anybody who uh, wants to really think hard about baseball, since baseball and first and second base and home runs and perfect games didn't exist until Abner Doubleday invented the game. Um, yeah. But nobody yeah. makes those kinds of objections against baseball. Mm -hmm. So these kinds of objections against analytic philosophy, I think, are, are just rather creative ways of saying, I don't, I don't like what you guys are doing, and I'm going to find some way to object to it. <laughs> it's kind of not. A, now, th that's not to say that every objection against analytic philosophy amounts to that. There are some good ones. And um, as we were discussing earlier, I do think that there is a worry that sometimes analytic philosophy becomes endless navel gazing that never actually makes any progress. Um, and I'm, I'm mm -hmm. sympathetic to that kind of concern. I don't think that that's what we're doing with the metaphysics of modality. I don't think that's no. what we're doing. when we talk about possibility or impossibility or possible worlds. Uh, I just think it's a really easy way to describe things. And I would strongly recommend to anybody who uh, wants to understand the way that I think about possible worlds that they read A World of States of Affairs by David Armstrong. Mm -hmm. who, by the way, is an atheist, right? He's not a not a, a theist or much less a Christian. But the way that he describes possible worlds, I think, is a very helpful account. And that's the one that I would want to make use of in, in proceeding with any kind of a modal ontological argument. Okay, good deal. Yeah, I think that's a good response. Uh, like, And I would say that the fact that you can explain the concept without appealing to the concept, you can explain what a possible world is without throw away the concept, you can still explain it. That kind of shows that that objection really doesn't work because you can explain it even in non-analytic terms and therefore, well, it's a fine concept. And if you want to use it, like you're saying, if you want to then turn around and use a different term, well, okay, but we're still talking about the same thing. Right, so, right. Okay. Very well, much. Huh? Very much agreed. Oh, good, good. Okay. Well, now I don't know if we'll agree as much because if you're ready, I'd like to... Uh, well, no, actually, I, I'm jumping ahead a little bit. First of all, it seems to me that it's the case that uh, the ontological argument gets a lot more hand wave dismissals than probably any other argument for God's existence. And it seems to me you can make a distinction here between what I'm going to call good and poor objections to it, like people who will say, well, if that argument works, we can prove there is a greatest possible cookie or other parody objections like that are just obviously bad objections that don't really work at all. Do, do you want to comment on that at all? Well, I agree with you. And I, I think that there are a lot, and, and this is not unique to the ontological argument per se. There are all kinds of minority report opinions in numerous areas of philosophy that <clears throat> people have not really taken the time to study well. And as a result of that, they are misunderstood. They're not taken seriously. And, um, you know, problems of bias loom large, mm -hmm. even, even for philosophers who are otherwise well-educated. And philosophy is increasingly a discipline where people specialize on some super specific thing. And they become a specialist, not just in philosophy, but in epistemology and not just epistemology, but in um virtue epistemology and not just virtue epistemology, but reliableist virtue epistemology and on and on and on and on and on you go down. And by the time that everything's done, somebody has a PhD in philosophy, but it's not clear that they really know a lot of what's going on in logic or philosophy of language or mm -hmm. metaphysics or yeah, ethics. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's an easy problem to fall into. Um, but I do think that the ontological argument suffers from a, an undue amount of hand-waving dismissal because of a lot of very poor criticisms that, upon further examination, turn out not to be very good criticisms at all. But, okay. you know, that's, that's not surprising to me. Um, 
Mm. But it, it is it is a situation that uh, we face. But again, I, I'm very happy to be comfortable as the minority, somebody who thinks ontological arguments are interesting and good arguments, even though the yeah. vast majority of philosophers disagree. So, okay. I, it would seem to me just obviously from the nature of what it's trying to do, it should be an interesting philosophical argument, even if you think it doesn't work, because it's looking at trying to look at the nature of what it means for a thing to be necessary, what it means for things to exist, what is the metaphysics of modality, how do we apply it, and all these very, very big, deep, and very interesting philosophical questions to the point where I would say to people, whether or not you think this works in as far as proving God, it's still something you should engage with because it's going to force you to then research and try to find answers to all these very important questions that surround it. So, yes, verily, and amen. But I want to... <laughs> I want to just add one thing to everything that you just said okay it's not just that this is interesting because we're thinking about possibility and necessity and possible worlds and um the the metaphysics of modality we're talking about god like mm -hmm. nothing can be more interesting than that right oh very true yes <laughs> even if you don't think god exists that's like super fundamental there 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 is no more ultimate ultimately meaningful question before you first figure out okay if god were to exist what god would be like and now that we know that does god exist mm -hmm. like those those are super important questions that yes. yes are are philosophically the most important questions that i think because if god exists god is the most fundamental thing period and everything else mm -hmm. that we think is going to be derivative of either god's existence or god's non-existence everything yeah. you think about uh knowledge and theory of knowledge everything you think about morality everything you think about causation and everything you think about possibility it's all logically downstream of whether or not there is a god and what that God is like if God exists or if God does not exist. Like, it's all secondary to, to those questions, at least on my view. And that's, that's uh, I think, I think the right view. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I couldn't agree I with you more. It's the right one, right? <laughs> so anyway. Well, the, well, there's at least two of us there who think that because, yeah, whether or not God exists is should be drastically important to your life and what you think and what you do. And if it's not, I, if you think it isn't, I would submit to you, you just haven't really thought about it or you're probably lying to yourself because, yeah, or, or you're not so fundamentally about important. God the right way. Like, yes, whether or that not too, that some, would, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Whether or not some ant in an ant pile in my yard exists or not is relatively insignificant because mm -hmm. it's an ant or a mosquito or something. But God is not like, that no oh. not at all no, yeah yeah no. okay yeah. well if you're uh ready and up for it then what i've done is uh i've compiled a list of what i think are the most the best objections that i've come across to the ontological argument and oh. i'm just going to start throwing them at you and you can respond as you as you uh best as you can see fit uh, so, so how does that sound yeah, so I need to know, am I holding a tennis racket and I'm trying to hit the tennis balls back to you, <laughs> or, or do I need to go put on some armor because you're going to be shooting bullets at me? With these, uh, I don't know. How is this going to well, go? Well, I, I'll, I'll tell you that um, I kind of go back and forth in my mind every day as to whether or not I think this works. It's kind of one of those arguments where I'm like, I really want it to work. Most of the objections I come across it just don't seem to work. Even these good objections, I think you can probably give me some answers to. But I, I still, there's still something about it where I'm like, I don't want to quite make the jump and say this works. But it's not like I'm going to try to, you know, mow you down and say, no, no, absolutely so, not. So hang on a minute. I, I want to ask you some questions now. <laughs> okay, that's fair. <laughs> what does it mean for an argument to work? Ah, or sorry. Well, what, there's what, let's first first. What would it mean for a modal ontological argument to work? Well, I guess that would depend on what you're trying to accomplish with it. So for the majority of the way it's been presented and uh, what I've read about it, then is it would it would prove the existence of God. 
Now, there's some other variants where people would say, like I think in Plantinga's uh, ver- variant in The Nature of Necessity, he says this establishes that it's reasonable to pr- believe in God, which is a lesser conclusion uh, than proving the existence of God. And um, I think there have been a couple of people who've just been really interested in whether or not it's a valid argument. So it, it, whether or not it works depends on what you're trying to accomplish with it. And so, but what most people, I think, typically mean by that, in just common speak, is well, it proves the existence of God. Okay, that's fine. I mean, I think most philosophers are generally in agreement that the modal ontological argument is logically valid. Yes, Michael, I agree. Tooley, mm-hmm. Michael Tooley, who I had the opportunity to dialogue recently with at uh, APA in Denver, he uh, he doesn't think it's valid for complicated reasons, but. Um, <clears throat> You know, I, I disagree. Um, but whether or not the argument is valid does nothing to establish whether or not it is sound, whether or not it works yes. in improving mm-hmm. this thing, right? So, um, but I just think, like, when when we back up and think about the success of an argument, of any philosophical argument more generally, um, if if we want to say that, like an argument would work in convincing all rational people that its conclusion is true, then there's no such thing as a good philosophical argument for anything, (laughs) right? Because, look, the logicians at NYU who are just super geniuses, they don't think monist ponens is a valid rule of inference. Now, look, modus ponens is one of the first laws of logic. And that's the, mm-hmm. the logic that says, if you know that it's true ahead of time, before you even do any logic, that if P, then Q, that's what you know ahead of time. Mm-hmm. And, then, and then you're given P is true. Now, if you know that if P, then Q, and you're given P, what can you conclude? Q. Q. Yeah, Q. that's Q. basic oh, logic. Yeah, that's basic. Yeah. Well, there's a bunch of people who are way smarter than I can ever hope to be who think modus ponens is not a legitimate rule of inference. So, look, if that's the the level of scrutiny that we want to put any argument to and before we count it as mm. a successful argument, then well, then let's give up because we're, you're not even going to be able to get uh, I think therefore I am out of any of that stuff because it's just too too strong of a of a definition of success because there's always going to be that crazy skeptic who can somehow outthink us on this whatever so i i don't know i'm i'm not persuaded that that's a a good definition of what a successful argument is okay i i see your point there yeah and um and i'm not trying to be critical here i'm just no no that's that's a good point i uh there's always a way you can object to anything, and I know that because I dated a girl one time who was extremely unreasonable, and no matter what I said, sometimes when she was just in that particular frame of mind, she would push and push and push until she found something wrong with what I was saying, no matter what it was. And so, Yeah, because up um, is down and black is white and left is right and, you know. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, then what would you say would be a good, a, mo- a better definition of a successful argument? What how would you characterize it? Yeah, I don't know. I, 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 I'm not offering an alternative there, so cop out okay. on me, right? So, but I, I will say this: like, I'm, I'm convinced that God exists. And if you ask me why do you think God exists, my answer is not, oh, well, the ontological argument just establishes it. I mean, if you just think about it, then blah 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 blah. My confidence that God exists does not depend on the success of the ontological argument, mm-hmm. nor does it, it and like. There's lots of what I think are good arguments for the existence of God. Um, But I am aware that there are objections to all of those arguments. Um, I I don't find myself with a confidence that God exists on the basis of a bunch of arguments. Those arguments bolster my confidence, Mm -hmm. but... If if somebody was able to come along tomorrow and conclusively show me that I'm in error and, you know, there's a, a new development in the metaphysics of modality and ontological arguments just are not successful in proving that God exists, um, 
there is zero chance that I'm going to go, oh, well, I guess God doesn't exist, and now I'm an atheist. Because mm -hmm. my, my belief that God exists is not dependent on this argument, or as far as I can tell on, on any argument, unless you think like arguments from religious experience count as arguments, because mm -hmm. I, um, I don't know. I, I, my life was radically changed in college. Mm -hmm. When when I came to know God, um, and I don't, I, I don't know, maybe I'm just radically deceived about that, but I haven't met anybody who wants to talk about their heart being changed and fundamental desires is what they wanted to do, not only like with their life, but like individual aspects within their life of, I used to like doing this and now all of a sudden I no longer like doing that. That kind of stuff doesn't. We seem to happen. I, I'm sorry to switch gears to talk about religious experience, but oh, that's fine. Yeah, I I don't mind going off on little tangents and in, into the weeds. Yeah. yeah, I've heard some people try to make religious experiences into arguments for the existence of God. Um, I think my memory serves me. There's an article on that in the uh, Blackwell Companion to Natural Theology, but I haven't got yeah. around to reading that one yet. So, um, but well, yeah, that's an interesting line of inquiry. Yeah. Let me, let me see if I can just motivate modal ontological arguments and then, and then we'll deal with the objections. Okay. Okay. That sounds um, good. It, imagine the, the following dialogue, right? Um, between someone who's agnostic and someone who, is a theist, right? Mm -hmm. And the agnostic asks the theist, well, you believe in God, right? Yeah, sure, I, be I believe in God. Huh, okay. Well, why do you believe in God? Well, there's lots of reasons why I believe in God. Okay, well, well, give me one. Well, uh, the ontological argument. I believe in God because of the ontological argument. And the agnostic responds and goes, well, what's the ontological argument? I've never heard of it. And then mm -hmm. the theist says, oh, well, this is the this is the modal ontological argument, walks through a perfect presentation of planning his argument. And the the atheist or excuse me, the agnostic is is keen on what's going on. He says that seems like a really good argument, but it all seems to depend on this one key premise. Mm -hmm. Possibly God exists. Yes, absolutely. Why should I think that premise is true? Why should I think possibly God exists? <clears throat> and suppose that the theist says, oh, well, why should you believe that possibly God exists? Well, there's the Kalam cosmological argument. There's the Leibnizian cosmological argument. Mm -hmm. There's the argument from motion, the argument from numbers. There's uh, the teleological argument. There's the moral argument. There's... Uh, there's so many arguments. There's all kinds of arguments. And, and the atheist or the agnostic is just just flabbergasted and not quite sure uh, what to think about all this. So he says, okay, well, I've not heard of any of those arguments. So what are they? And then the theist patiently explains this is what the Kalam is. This is what the Leibnizian mm -hmm. cosmological argument is. the argument from motion. These are the argument from numbers and on and on and on. And then the agnostic if they're an open-minded person and, and they don't have like strong responses to all these, it seems like the rational thing to do is to go, well, gosh, in light of all that, it sure does seem reasonable to think maybe God exists, right? Yeah, yeah. It'd be a long conversation, but I get your point. Yeah. Yeah. So so possibly God exists. And then and then the theist goes, Okay, well, now you see that it's like perfectly reasonable to think that possibly God exists. And the agnostic goes, Yeah, yeah, I think so. And then the theist says, okay, now that you can see possibly God exists, let's revisit the ontological argument. And then, ta-da, on the other side. So as I see it, um, as Richard Swinburne develops something like a cumulative case for getting... Now, Richard and I disagree, and we've talked about this at length. Um, mm -hmm. He doesn't think that God is a necessary being. But yeah, that's one of the I, objections I intend to bring up, so yeah. Yeah, yeah. but... Um, he does favor something like a cumulative case for theism. And the way that I see it, the ontological argument can kind of serve as the bookends of the arguments for the existence of God, including the argument for, from so many arguments for the existence of God. So you start with the ontological argument, 
Then you look at all of the other arguments. And then you look at the argument from so many other arguments. And then you, in light of all that, use all of that to motivate the key premise of the ontological argument, mm -hmm. possibly God exists. Now, notice that a lot of those other arguments proceed by way of a posteriori. Yeah, yeah. That's what I was going to just point out. Yeah, exactly. So mm -hmm. this is a way that you can incorporate a posteriori reasoning in motivating the key premise of what is otherwise an entirely a priori argument for the existence of God. And that's why I want to say that maybe it makes sense to talk about a posteriori mm -hmm. ontological arguments. And that's yeah, kind of I'm, the way. So, I, in in the paper that I gave at the uh, APA a mm -hmm. few weeks ago, I laid out a lot of complicated math about Bayesian approaches to this. And if your credence level is here, how could that be influenced up or down on the basis of these other arguments, which might get you um, some of the independent attributes of God? So, if you think that God is a maximally great being, then you think that God has maximal controls of power, knowledge, and love. And it sure seems to me like moral arguments for the existence of God get you a necessarily existent being who's omnibenevolent, all-loving. Mm -hmm. um, at least on certain Thomistic controls of divine power, uh, various cosmological arguments are going to get you a necessarily existent omnipotent being, and yep. maybe mm -hmm. even both omnipotence and omniscience. Um, so you do the Bayesian math on all this and you, you throw it all into a blender and whatever your antecedent credence level was with respect to this key premise, possibly God exists, you revisit that in light of all these other arguments and it's got to go up. There's, there's no rational way that it couldn't unless you had a significant philosophical defeater for each and every argument for the existence of God besides the ontological argument. And I'm just persuaded that there's lots of uh, good arguments. Not all of them are good, but okay, um, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of increases um, my confidence that the chief premise of the ontological argument is true. And if that's true, then the rest of the argument runs rather uncontroversially. Yeah, I I couldn't agree with you more on that point. That's one of the key things that I found in the research I did, where it seemed to me like the uh, informed and reasonable critics of the argument all agreed look you can make a valid version of this argument because their objections at least the atheist objections were always to the premise of the argument it wasn't to the logic of it it was to, they turned around and denied that it's possible that god exists or did something similar and that tells me well you grant me the logic if that's your objection and right. so the fact that both the critics and proponents are saying this logic works that tells me okay, the logic of this almost certainly works when both the critics and the proponents are saying, yeah, it works. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Okay. So anyway, there's there's kind of a brief sketch of my defense of, of how I would want to go about approaching <laughs> ontological arguments. Um, and now maybe it makes sense to try to fight off some of the bad guys. <laughs> All right. So that's where I've split up Ben and I's discussion on the ontological argument. Um Next week, I will go into the, a lot more of the objections to the argument that are the good objections that are given by the well-informed philosophers, and you can see how Ben responds to those. Um, as far as this week goes, I hope that was a pretty good explanation, and you learned quite a bit about what the ontological argument is and what it's trying to do. And as always, uh, give me some feedback. You can reach me at theexaminedlifewithphil at gmail.com or reach me at the Facebook group, The Examined Life with Phil. Let me know what you think about the ontological argument. What do you think about Ben's approach of trying to t make it from an a priori arg argument into a a posteriori argument that makes use of the, all the other arguments for God's existence? Do you think? I think that's kind of a clever approach. So let me know what you think, and if you have any questions about the ontological argument, the terms we've used, or any of the other various things, uh, feel free to write in and ask questions. I'll be happy to respond to any of them. And as always, if you like what I'm doing here in the podcast. Uh, share it on social media, give us a review on iTunes, or wherever else you get the podcast. So next week I'll put out the second part where Ben responds to the objections, and until then, have a good time, and I'll talk to you again next week.
We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.